Hello, I'm Helene Oberman, Managing Director of Interior Design Magazine, and I'd like to welcome you. We are here to discuss the Italian art of kitchen design, creating the heart of the home. We have seen over the years the resurgence of the kitchen as the center of life within a residence and its evolution into a personalized space accommodating the wants and desires of a homeowner. There is one company, an industry leader, and a design icon on the rise who knows how to create solutions to meet these very needs. Quality, craftsmanship, functionality, oh, oh yes, don't forget the design, are the key ingredients that help define Bertazzoni, a 140-year-old family-owned appliance brand built on tradition and now advancing through innovation. With me here today to fire up a conversation on modern day kitchen design, Italian style that is, are members of the Bertazzoni family. But first, for amazing audience out there, please make sure to stick around to the end of the program to learn about a wonderful giveaway. With that, I'd like to welcome the Bertazzoni family. Benvenuti a tutti. It's great to be here. So I am so very excited to see you all today, and I'm sorry it's not in person. But while I'm in New York, Paolo, where are you all located? We're seated at today at Casa Bertazzoni. It's the home of our brand and company. It's adjacent to our factory and represents the journey through the values of our brand. Family and tradition, engineering and product, land and food culture. So where in Italy is Casa Bertazzoni? We are in Emilia-Romagna region. It's a very fortunate location. Uh, we are in the triangle between Milan, Venice and Florence at equal distances. So when I think of Emilia-Romagna, and of course I've probably been spending a little too much time at home these days, I imagine myself strolling through the streets of Bologna, Parma and Ravenna. But can you tell me, what is the region actually known for? Engineering and good food. Simple as that. Engineering, because manufacturers like Ferrari, Maserati, Lamborghini and other luxury Italian car brands are located here. Emilia Romagna is uh, famous for its food culture, having been the food basket of Italy since the Roman Empire. Prosciutto, Parmesan cheese, balsamic vinegar are few or the, or the most famous uh, producers of this region. So it makes perfect sense for a kitchen brand to launch in a region known for such amazing food products. Paolo, as a company with over 140 years of expertise, can you share how the kitchen has evolved over time? It, it is true that uh, there has been an evolution uh, of the kitchen space from a functional one to an experiential space. The kitchen and the living room are now merged into a single space that has now a different role, is the hub of the home, is a gathering space for family and friends. And, uh, and this is a, the, the right area where to create uh, joy through beauty and ambience. So you mentioned that Emilia Romagna is known for performance cars, but can you draw any parallels between those luxury automobiles and today's kitchen appliances which we know are investments well spent. Well, that, that's a bold comparison. It's true that uh, the amount of money that you have to invest for a new car is uh, probably the same that you, you would invest uh, in planning a new, a new kitchen. Yeah, people choose a car for the task it should perform, like uh, appliances. Maybe they choose it for the features, yes. But I reckon more for the character. Uh, the character is the expression of the style that you see in, in an object, in the car. And is also the way uh, to express your own style. Likewise, appliances uh, are contributing to the style, to the mood of the entire kitchen design. We, as Bertazzoni, we are aware that uh, we design appliances with a clear personality, with enough character to fulfill the need of creating and expressing your own kitchen style, whether it is contemporary, traditional or classic. When a kitchen is being planned, we, we want the homeowner to decide what mood to convey to the people actually living in the kitchen. The design of our appliances has to fit, it has to express that mood, 
with balance and consistency. In that sense, uh, it is our purpose to give joy in creating ambience and style in a personalized environment. But also, we are fully aware appliances must give the joy in preparation of the meal. Absolutely, and in my mind, I feel that those home brands are achieving, if not surpassing, the same level of style and recognition as those luxury car brands. So Valentina, can you tell us the secret of how you design those very stylish products? Bertazzoni's design philosophy is a unique combination of functionality and style. Our products are engineered to perform supremely well every day, and they are designed to look beautiful into the kitchen. The kitchen is the heart of the home. It is rationality and emotion. The engineers working constantly together with designers in order to make the best product. This comes from our culture. It's of course the Italian culture, but more specifically it's the Bertazzoni culture. We pursued this for generations. And you can actually see these two aspects into the product. Rationality finds its expression in the simplicity of lines, the authenticity of the, of the materials uh, that we select, in the precise attention to design solutions. Emotion on the other side is in the character of every style, in the care for details, in the sophisticated finishes, the happiness deriving from our color palette, and the use of precious metals. So we know and understand that homeowners love to personalize their space and Bertat Zoni allows one to express their personal style through your products. The different finishes and the wide choice of colors really give the possibility to add a personal touch to the kitchen. Take the texture paint with a metallic finish. That gives a tactile experience. Or the automotive paint with five layers in a seven-step process. The final polishing is handmade, and that gives this extraordinary shine and depth. The enamel is inspired to the wood-burning stoves that we used to build here in the 1920s, and of course today is executed with innovative technology. The variety of our color palette, uh, it goes from traditional ones like black, white, ivory, to the brightest, like yellow, orange, and red. Also think about the Collezione Metalli. The use of precious metals comes from Italian jewelry tradition. We created highlights for the Heritage Series, plated in real gold, real copper, and black nickel. The combination with our stainless steel or the other finishes is sophisticated and unique. At the end, the design is about the legacy, about knowing the idea that is behind the concept, how it is made, the visual fulfillment, in a word, the beauty. This is the magic of owning a design product. So Valentina mentions capturing the heritage of the brand, but modernizing it to fit today's style. Nicola, can you explain how Bertazzoni has been able to advance the brand over the last 140 years through innovation? You know, innovation has been a passion for our family ever since the founding of the company in 1882, when our ancestors, by putting together ideas from different fields, created the first wood-burning stove, an innovative product that made the life of homeowner easier, allowing them to reach better results in cooking and heating homes. And evolving from there, we have pioneered gas in the 50s and continued in the following years with the introduction of convection cooking, microwave, induction, and steam, all the way to refrigeration and food and beverage preservation systems. When we think of innovation at Bertazzoni, we always have three goals in mind. Number one, good results. Number two, convenience of use. And three, the personalization for homeowners. We call it omni-fuel approach. That means allowing consumers to choose amongst all different technologies in coordinated styles. And it's not about either or, it's more as well as. It is enabling 
our customers to perform several types of cooking and allowing them different types of installation designs. Bertazzoni can meet all those expectations. Technology plays a huge part of our lives today and has permeated even more so into the kitchen space. How can technology be used to enhance one's personal cooking lifestyle? One of the value for Bertazzoni is the food culture, which guides all of us in the company to consider and utilize technology to help users, to help them achieving great results and facilitating them to express their personal styles and preferences. Recently, we see solid indicators that induction and steam cooking are expanding from few enthusiasts to a broader customer base. This manifests the desire to tailor the cooking experience at home. Our goal is to make kitchen appliances more versatile with useful innovation. So we've talked about how Bertazzoni has maintained relevance over the past century, but Elisabetta, what does it mean to preserve that legacy? Uh, yes, so nurturing our legacy is a responsibility we owe to our family and our land. It develops uh, naturally as the culture of our brand reflects the essence of our region, Emilia-Romagna. Uh, we have a joyful way of life, the passion for quality food, culinary tradition, and in this case, an instinctive curiosity for a perfect balance between technology and tradition. Our parents um, have raised us with these values and uh, it is our responsibility to pass them on to the new generation. Uh, when my brother and I were little ch children, our father would occasionally take us on the factory on halt and uh, we were amazed by the complexity and mysteries of the production line. To our many questions, the answers we were given um, were a mix of passion and pride, uh, like being told, for example, that uh, the design and materials of the knobs and dials were inspired by the perfection and beauty of the Swiss watches. To this day, uh, we try off that childhood imagina imagination, evolving our business uh, with the same passion and pride. We are fully aware of what it means to put the family name as a badge of commitment on every single product. A commitment to our legacy, to our, our wider family and our customer. So as a Bertazzoni owner myself, I know that the passion and pride of the brand comes through in your product design. But you can also see that the pride is carried through and shared with each family member when you educate the next generation of homeowner about the brand. Uh, I believe we have to encourage the next generation to interpret uh, these values so with an eye on to evolution of culture and innovation. It is also important to us uh, to see our family members to contribute alongside our wider family, that is our team and employees. This is why our customers feel the authentic and genuine experience of the brand and this is why each generation of our family is a custodian and purveyor of brand values and tradition. For Valentina and I, this compass is enormously important. While we believe and navigate by these values, we are given the freedom to interpret those for the present and for the future. This allows us to ensure that we connect with today's people and that the brand remains relevant. We've talked about those brand values, but Paolo, is there a core brand mission? To cook beautifully is our brand promise. That means in broader terms, uh, achieving amazing cooking results, uh, at the same time taking care of your loved ones in a beautiful kitchen uh, is about uh, charm, is about well-being, is about feeling good. Since the founding of the company we have always strived to bring joy to the homeowner. So this calls to mind a quote from famed Italian architect Gio Ponti. He said, the Italian house offers our spirit an invitation to rejoice 
and restful visions of peace and sunny nature. This is what comfort means in the true sense of the Italian word conforto. Can you share how Bertazzoni can infuse the concept of joy into a home? I embrace Joe Ponti's vision. It resonates well with our ultimate aim, improve the lives of those using Bertazzoni products, strengthen the ties and the bonds with family and friends, prepare and enjoy meal together, the sense of contentment uh, by looking at something beautiful. Feel a sense of the gift that gives on giving. It's the Italian art of living and cooking. So this art of Italian living and cooking is outlined in your new monograph, which we know is part of a larger series of other iconic engineering brands and your neighbors, Ferrari and Ducati. So Valentina, can you tell us a little bit more about the look and feel of this new monograph? We are honored to be included in the ranks of these legends in Italian design. We had the chance to reflect on our heritage and evolution over the, over the past century. The monograph captures a moment in time to celebrate our roots and our vision for tomorrow as we approach our 140th anniversary next year. This is our past, present, and future, and reflects the legacy we hope to leave behind. Well, to Valentina and to the whole Bertazzoni family, I'd really like to say grazie mille. And first, before we get to that amazing giveaway, I just want to say that we've learned so much today about the evolution of the kitchen space, but of course about the secrets of Bertazzoni, their design products, and the legacy of their brand. So Bertazzoni's mission of creating joy will ring true today, tomorrow, and for generations to come, and I look forward to seeing them rise in the ranks of iconic design brands. And now, for what all of you have been waiting for, that amazing giveaway. So our friends and family at Bertazzoni are offering a trip for two, all expenses paid to Italy, centered around what, but what else? Cooking and the culinary style of Emilia Romagna. So to learn more and to obviously register for this amazing sweepstakes, please go to the website listed on the screen now. But that's not all. Bertazzoni is graciously offering a 15% discount to their new monograph, Cooking is an Art. Go to the website on the screen and enter Bertazzoni15 to get a copy of this masterpiece. Thank you again to the entire Bertazzoni family for all of their insight today. And to you, our amazing audience, please make sure to check out the Bertazzoni website to learn more about the brand and, of course, their entire suite of appliances. Welcome to the premiere of Creative Conversations on Design TV, where I sit down with some of the most imaginative minds and interesting people in design to unlock their creative process and discover what turns them on. Today, I'm thrilled to speak with renowned ceramicist and ultimate weekend farmer, Christopher Spitzmiller. Christopher has a new book, A Year at Clovebrook Farm, chronicling life at his bucolic home in Millbrook, New York full of his words of wisdom on gardening, entertaining, housekeeping, and more. If ever there was a feel-good book for these times, it's this one. Christopher, it's so nice to be with you. Thank you for joining me today on the premiere. Thank you for having me, Pam. I appreciate it. Yeah, you are a creative that I just admire so much. So it's really truly an honor and congratulations on your book. We're gonna get into that uh, in a bit. Um, but I wanted to start off, Christopher, you are to me just a true multi-hyphenate. You're a ceramicist, a gardener, designisty, a cook, and now an author. And I'm just curious, you know, <clears throat> taking it all the way back, what was your 
first love in, you know, creatively when you were, when you were a kid? I have a memory of being at a ceramics class that my cousin was enrolled in as well too. And I made a little pinch pot of a, a piggy bank, you know, with the old form where a, a wine cork was its nose and you took the wine cork out to get the money out of it. And I was um, not available or, the, or sick the day that the glaze was. So my cousin actually glazed the outside of the little, um, the little pig. And, you know, to me, the idea of making something that was tactile and useful and could improve people's lives hit me all the way back then whether it was a lamp, a little bowl at the level I was working at, whatever I could do. And I think that that perv pervades and goes forward with what I'm doing today because it's like growing flowers, cooking, all of these things enrich people's lives in some way. And I think that that's, that's really what I'm about is enriching lives. Yeah, that's so interesting. I remember as a kid too, I took, I took a lot of like, there was like a neighbor who uh, her mom taught ceramics and I didn't follow the ceramics. I was more into like the painting and drawing part of it, but it's so great to have those classes and be exposed to that when you're, when you're a child, because I think it, it, it just, you know, you never know where it's going to take you. So your new book, A Year at Clovebrook Farm, which I'm going to hold up here because I've got it right here. <laughs> I've got so many like dog eared pages in this, <laughs> but I have your book, congratulations. It, it chronicles a year at your country home in Millbrook. And you dedicated the book to Albert Hadley. He's one of the most beloved American interior designers and decorators. And you credit him with giving you the confidence to go forward and make your dreams come true. And I wanted to hear, you know, what were those early uh, dreams that you had when you were starting your career, number one? Um, and secondly, you talk a little bit about how um, Albert Hadley helped nurture and give you the creative courage to sort of, you know, move forward. Well, when he would call, it, he would have Nancy Porter, who was his assistant forever, and she would call, and it was sort of like as close as I would get to having the president of the United States calling me on the phone, and Nancy would call, hold for Albert Hadley, he wants to have a few words with you, and you'd hold, and there'd be a few rings, and he would get on the phone, and he would say this stuff like, he barely knew me, you know, Albert's strength was finding young talent and going out there and nurturing it which is something that I try to do with the people who work for me and friends that I have. He didn't always go to the same resources over and over again. He did use the same upholsterers, but he would move within the group to figure out who was the best at different things and really snipped out new people whenever they were. So with me, it was this idea of like, you know, you can just go over to my friends, the Kfritzes and take some lamps over there, take the ones out of their bedroom and put these ones up there. And, you know, he gave access to a lot of us that we wouldn't have had normally and ease through it all. And I think the other part that I learned from Albert was he had great manners. Every time I would go to his apartment to visit him, he would be standing in the doorway. There was no buzzing and waiting for Albert. He was just there and accessible and welcoming and always a gentleman. And, you know, that's kind of rare these days. We don't have many of that type around. So. I agree. So I have to ask, like, did, when you were starting out, did you have creative fear? Did I have creative fear? I had creative anxiety and the creative anxiety still creeps back in some days. And the creative anxiety is not about what I'm making. It's about like, are we going to make it? You know, because I talk about my early days in the studio in Georgetown where I started out my work and I had like three really good clients or four really good clients. And I said to myself back then, if I had three or four more clients like these, everything would be fine. And I'll tell you now, I make things for everybody and their sister in the design world, and things are not fine. There are still problems and there's still issues, as you know, in the publishing world. It's sort of a whack-a-mole that comes along of like, you get one problem done and then another one comes up. But, um, you know, that's, it's learning to cope with it and learning to believe in yourself of like, I can back away from this with my anxiety. And what I do to treat my own anxiety is, A, I run a lot, which helps with it. But B, when it's happening in the studio is I sit down at the potter's wheel and I make something and the problem goes out of my head and the act of being there alone with the clay and creating five, six new things, that that's the, that's the, 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 the cure to the, to the problem. It is in the creating itself. 
Um, I, I think it's so interesting to talk to artists and creators about like, imaginative side and you know how things manifest. And so, you know, can you can you talk a little bit about um, you know how do you communicate as an artist and creative? You know, what's in your mind? You're going to sit down behind the wheel, <laughs> and you know, how does it go from like what's in here to you know what what comes out on the wheel? Well, first I'll find the idea. I'll like search. I'm an auction house junkie because I love to find things and buy stuff. And that's that's one of my main venues for picking up new ideas because there's a lot of old shapes out there that uh, I look at and then reinterpret myself and do my own sort of spin on what's already existing. Um, so I, I take a, a picture and then the picture turns into a sketch and the sketch is pasted on the window in front of my wheel. And I sit there with a... Um, a metal measuring uh, stick to get my measurements right. And I throw two or three pieces, I join them together. I then go back in and I trim them. And it's a, a about a week long process of just getting the form right. And when I'm doing the first ones, I always make about six to eight of them. And then I line the six or eight of them up at the time that I'm done. And I look at them and I pick out the one that is the best. And that's the one that we make a mold from and produce things out of and, and go that way. So that's what my design process is like. So when you, if you're working on, you know, putting out sort of like a series of, let's just say, you know, um, dishes or mugs or, you know, whatever you're, whatever you're going to put out, what does that timeline look like from concept to, you know, being in, in market? We can do relatively quick with the first initial ones, the hand-thrown ones. Those can be produced in sort of probably four to six weeks to eight weeks. Then making a mold, letting the mold dry and going into it in a bigger way is probably another, you know, four to six weeks on top of that and having a good inventory on it. You know, it's never fast enough. I wish it was faster than it is, but at the same time, it, um, you know, 90 Eight percent of what I do works and the, the most uh, harrowing part of it is assigning a name like if I'm going to give something the name Pamela like a, for a good client I um, I want it to be a shape that works and sells and is going to go so we'll make the first ones and maybe we don't put a name on them to begin with we see how people react to them and then I'll go back and be like okay that can be Anthony that can be William you know um, I'll have something in mind sometimes of a friend or a client that I want to name it after, but I'm a little sort of cagey about putting it on there. <laughs> it's a commitment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I want to take it back to, um, to Clovebrook Farm. When you grew up in the country, you were drawn to your home in Millbrook, falling in love with uh, what, you would, what you called an old white down on its luck house with lots of potential. And um, in, in your book, in you say that Clovebrook Farm helped you set goals and inspired your dreams. Talk a little bit about the magic of that home and, and you know, how, how, again, some of your goals and your inspirations sort of came through the process of this, of this home. Well, when you've got a whole list of a punch list of things that need to get done, like let's say, you know, I started with the outside of my house and we put a, a new paint job on the whole outside. And then the, the next thing, or maybe even before this was a new heating and air conditioning system because it was cold as anything in there. Um, I replaced the windows, you know, I would make lists of things that I want to get done and I would pay for them as I could afford to. And so I would get one project done and then I'd say, okay, the next thing we're going to do is chimneys. So I would like, you know, get an estimate from the chimney man and, you know, I'd get together, say about half of the money that I needed to get the project done and get it started. And then through the weeks of the project, I'd make the other half to pay the chimney man and get that under control and it was you know six slow years of, of doing that but you know I took vacations I went out for dinner but it it gave me some priorities of like this is really what I want to spend my money on and what I want to invest in because it will give me the most reward in the long long term so that's what I what I did how did you how was it that home that you fell in love with how long did the sort of courtship take place? I.e., you know, were you were you sort of like, I want a home in the country? You know, we were on a mission, or did you sort of just 
come upon this home and then oh, you're in love and you see the vision of it. I was on a mission. I was 35 years old and I had been saving and making myself put a certain amount of money in every month and being like, okay, you can do this. And I can be a little, a little freer once that is accomplished. And I had been up in Millbrook before I had shared a house with a partner of mine and he wanted just that much more for it than I wanted to, to, to spend. And um, in the end, he and everybody else says that I ended up in the place that I am supposed to. And I say that to people anytime they're having any real estate angst, because I really firmly believe you end up in the house where you're, where you're supposed to be. So this, I was looking online, I found an old house in the center of a town that I didn't know was in the center of a town in an old pool. And my broker was like the pool. I mean, it was like old when I was a kid. That's how old the pool was. And, <laughs> you know, the broker made me laugh. And I was like, oh, this is good. But then I discovered it was right there in this little hamlet. And I wanted to live in the middle of the country. And so I figured it out. And I'm like, you know, you got to get me out of looking at this because I don't even want to go in there. And she took me to this one that hadn't gone on the market yet and I fell in love and it was rather quick and it happened very fast. I looked at the house um, about mid-October and by December 15th that year, I owned the house and it had all this big personality to it. It's not an enormous house. It's, it's under 3,000 square feet, but there are nice high ceilings of nine feet in the downstairs and eight feet in the upstairs and each room had a different vocabulary of Greek revival moldings. And I could see that this would have real potential. It was it was rough back then, but I went for it. You made it, you made it a jewel. I also love in your book that you talk about how you know you entertained in the house when it was being renovated, right? I could just like, like imagine this fabulous party where like half the walls are up and <laughs> and, and you didn't want to wait for it to be done. Um, you know, we're both working in industries. I'm in, I'm in publishing, obviously. We want the house to look a certain way when we're going to go in and photograph it. And you, particularly, you know, as a lamp maker, you know, it, it sort of has to be perfect. So I think it's, it's sort of an interesting conversation about, you know, perfection versus imperfection. And I, I thought it was kind of interesting that you were willing to, you know, let people in when it wasn't all done. Talk a little bit about that and, and your philosophy on, per, you know, wabi-sabi, things that are imperfect versus, you know, perfection. First of all, I hate it when a friend buys something new or has a new project going on and they say, oh, we, you can't see it until it's done. Because I want to see the process. I want to see the studs in the house. I want to see, you know, like, the bathroom. I want to hear their ideas. I want to give them ideas. You know, I mean, a lot of things that transpired at my house came through friends. Like there is a whole third floor to my house that like, I didn't want to put a bathroom up there. I was being cheap and whatnot. And a neighbor came over during the process of putting my bathroom in and goes, you just put the pipes in the wall. You just run them up there. Maybe you never use them, but the pipes are, are going to be in the wall. And eventually several years later like four years later I got to that project and there's a bathroom up there and I am very glad that that neighbor told me to do that because I wouldn't have done it on my own and you know it's invaluable like the the advice that you get from your friends and have a meal have you can set up a table in a house that's crumbling falling down which certainly is what I did and just enjoy what you've got around you and enjoy the company of people so I agree I think it's so much about you know the process the inspiration which you know when I went through your book I was sharing with you that that's to me one of the I mean in, in addition to the amazing photography and the story it just feels so inspirational collaborative and like you've let you, as a reader I felt like I was like inside your world a little bit so that's what made me just so attracted um, to the book and it seems like that's how you live your life authentically which is wonderful um, I want to talk a little bit about you know as a potter you primarily I would assume you know work alone right behind the wheel you're you're you're, you're by yourself what goes through your head as you create? Is there a process? Are you, do you listen to music? Are you listening to the birds chirping? What's it like? Do you have to be in that, in a certain sort of creative mode to get behind that um, wheel and work by yourself? My favorite time is when I can work alone, like after five o'clock when everybody has gone home, that's when I am the most 
productive. I can make things during the day when, when there are people there, but I was signing books yesterday to employees and I astoundingly signed 15 of them off to different employees that work for me, which I'm thrilled that I have and they are great, but like that sort of solitude has gone away and there's now an industry that employs people and stuff, but I still like that five o'clock or in the country, people go home a little bit earlier at four o'clock so I can get my hands dirty a little bit earlier there. Um, that's my favorite time. I listen to NPR. I'm an NPR addict. I'm not a big music person and I don't drive around in my car with playlists and run with playlists. I, I kind of like the solitude part of it. And I sit there and I work. And as they say, all the problems of the day sort of melt away and I'm left there with just the, uh, the raw piece of clay and molding this dust that's got a little bit of water in it into something that's going to resonate and be around long after I am gone is very, very fulfilling. And then to open up a magazine like Lux and to see some people in Minnesota or Los Angeles that have bought a pair of my lamps or some of my plates and are using them that I, I didn't maybe even know their decorator. You know, they just, they did it and it's enriching their lives, which is where we started that idea of like, okay, I wanna make something that adds some beauty because I was, I was talking to another magazine editor yesterday about pretty and how I sort of lamented that pretty is seeming to be dying and I don't like pretty to die you know I'm about visual comfort and I find it to be a really uniting factor in all of us and can bring us together and sort of take up some of the political divides that seem to be cutting us all apart right now which I'm not I, fan of. yeah I, I agree I mean I'm a big believer in you know beauty pretty will like saves your soul honestly I, I'm right there with you um, talking about pretty and saving one's soul, I have a very clear visual memory of your holiday desserts that were on Instagram <laughs> over over Thanksgiving and, and Christmas. And I remember like sort of drooling over my telephone as I was <laughs> as I was uh, watching them go through and your partner, uh, who's a landscape architect, Anthony Bellamo, made your mother's traditional Christmas chocolate roll. And there were like these amazing souffles coming out of your oven. And, um, you know, I love, honestly, this is like on my list for this weekend to make these sort of like thin chocolate chip um, cookies. So I love that you've got, you know, recipes um, in the book. What are, what's your, do you have a favorite? And talk a little bit about your love for, um, you know, cooking and entertaining my mom was a big cook and I inherited that from her she loved to entertain and set a table and I as a little kid I remember stopping off and the way home from our house in Cape Cod and I found a book on napkin folding and I was like please mom please when did the book on napkin folding and yet when I told her I was gay years later she was astounded <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I, I like to entertain and I like to put forth a good table. And so I like to cook and I've taught myself all of these different recipes. And what I'll do is I'll take Martha's cookbook. I'll take the Toll House cookie recipe. I'll take like five different cookie recipes, recipes from friends, and I'll cook them and I'll see what the best parts of each of them are. And I'll play with them. Like in my recipe, I took out the baking powder to see what that was like. What do you think you would have when you take the baking powder out? You would think you'd have like a flat cookie. You have the exact opposite. The cookie gets sort of bubbly and it becomes big. So I'm like fine with monkeying with the recipe. Like, I'll, and I don't know the chemistry behind it but I'll just like monkey with it and the result is these cookies that you take out of the oven when they're still a little bit sort of raw in the center of them they finish cooking on the top of your oven from the heat of the pan and you have to use parchment paper I say this in the recipe don't even bother making the cookies unless you have the parchment paper um, they're crispy yet soft in the center and they're really 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 delicious so they've got twice as many red, uh, chocolate chips in them as regular recipes have. Um, give them a try. You'll, you'll, you'll I, I am there on my hit list for this weekend, for sure. And, and I mean, all your, the dahlias and all the flowers, your gardening. When you, when you bought the house, Christopher, did you, did you envision all of the, was like all of this beautiful life that you live sort of envisioned in your head or did it did it sort of just you know e evolve oh it totally evolved I mean I had this vision for this very simple house that would have like 
sofas with ticking on them. And, you know, it was all going to be very sort of simple and down to earth and maybe like scrubbed oaky kind of floors and stuff. And, you know, then Albert Hadley was closing his business at the time I was doing the decoration. So I bought a tremendous amount of furniture out of his warehouse and was able to decorate it with that. And I knew because you can see my apartment here, it looks like an oxygenarian lives in. It's done in that sort of high Colfax Fowler kind of like way. And so I wanted it to be sort of fresher and more youthful up there, which I think I accomplished. Um, and so the, the, the path, turns and as I was getting my dining room done my mom was having this conversation with a friend of hers who had some wallpaper that is originally came from a Russian palace and Ellen Biddle Shipman put it in this house in my hometown in the 1930s and when the house was sold in the 1980s the wallpaper was taken off of the walls and put into some trash bags the wallpaper sat there for some 20 years and my mom was trying to get a, a dealer interested in buying it. And I didn't want to hear this conversation anymore. I, I didn't think I wanted the wallpaper myself, but I just was like, can you just send me a piece of it? Because I know every designer, I think that there is out there and I'll find a home for it. And the wallpaper came and I fell in love, hook, line and sinker with it. And this is like really fancy stuff. And I hadn't planned on doing that. I didn't know what it would be in there, but you know, it's been a process and things have fallen into my lap when they were supposed to fall into my lap and things that weren't supposed to fall in my lap didn't fall in my lap. So I'm, you know, you, you have to look at it. I'm not one of those people who could just raise my pocketbook up and say, okay, let's presto change all. Let's have this dream come true. You know, um, I'm right now renovating a barn and it's a, quite a daunting process, but you break it up into smaller pieces and it'll get done when it gets done. And, you know. Well, I have to say, I absolutely love that wallpaper in your dining room. I thought it was divine. Um, and on my final question, you know, you, um, in your book, you, you write how you believe that everyone has a garden within us and that it's, you know, up to each of us to sort of tend to it, nurture it, and, and let it flourish. Talk a little bit about how you tend and nurture your creative side. And, you know, what advice would you give? We have a lot of people watching. What advice would you give, particularly nowadays, um, when, you know, it's hard to be inspired. We're not traveling. We're not socializing as much. Um, how, how do you think that we can all sort of nurture a little garden and, and our creative sides? I think the garden is, you know, as a proverbial thing and not a literal thing, is about getting up in the morning and getting yourself some exercise and to get outside and get some fresh air or to do something. Maybe it's a, a, a workout online, you know, you can do whatever you're, you're able to do. But then it's, it's giving yourself some time to think about what's important and what you want to do. You know, switching back to the, the gardening metaphor, I always order my ball or my peonies in the season that they're in flower because if you order them in that season you're not going to go to the order form say that fall and find that sold out thing going on because like I want to have what I want to have and if I do it that way it's then sort of a challenge when the fall comes and they arrive what actually is coming in those boxes and where they're going to go and it's like a battle of like <laughs> The, the labor and getting people in place to get it all planted because everybody thinks I'm like bulbs they cost like a dollar uh, a piece maybe or even less sometimes but it's it's really the investment in getting them in the ground whether you're going to dig it yourself or find somebody to help you plant them and I totally believe anyway church for me is going into that garden or going into that space where I'm working in the potter's wheel after five o'clock and I'm just giving my concentration and giving it all to it. You know, there, there was a, a show of basket weaving in Washington DC and I remember them clearly saying in that, that every time the weaver made a weave, she thought, make it good, put your heart into it. And yeah. I believe in that and putting my heart into it. We don't send any junk out. You know, I'm, I'm very careful. Like if we have an order, it's gotta be the best that somebody can be. And I tell people all the time, I'm like, we sell lamps, we don't sell excuses. You gotta get things there on time is the other part. And if you can't get them there on time, we will lend something, we will get something in that space if an installation is occurring, like that timeliness. I think that that's something that creatives sometimes forget about is the business reality side to delivering and to being attentive to customers and their needs and stuff. 
Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for sharing your creative gift with us all. And again, I'm just encouraging everyone. This book is such an inspiration. It's such a delight. Congratulations to you. I know I'm going to be making your um, cookies this weekend. And <laughs> thanks for being on uh, our Creative Conversations premiere, Christopher. It's been a pleasure.